what is the operating system running on your computer or phone right now, whatever you're watching this on? You might not even know. These days, it's probably whatever software came with it when you bought it. You know, most of the technology we buy will have software that goes along with the hardware. And when it comes to self-custody wallet, your hardware wallet is often very similar. Just like with your computer, sticking with the bundle software is fine for most people, but it's worth understanding that there are some reasons why you might want to have a go at running something else. Fortunately, one of the most underrated features of hardware wallets is that they make it really easy to have a dabble of using different wallet software with the hardware device without compromising your wallet security or risking your funds. So in this video, I'm just going to talk about vendor supplied wallet software versus third party wallet software and some of the strengths and weaknesses of each of these approaches, as well as how this might factor into your decisions around which hardware wallet you might want to buy or build. So let's get into it. And if you haven't already done so, hit subscribe and that way you can stay in the loop for content I make to help you find your way in the crazy and often hostile environment that is cryptocurrency. So the first thing I want to mention is the main benefit of sticking with the vendor supplied software bundled with your hardware wallet, and that is simplicity. One of the biggest challenges with crypto generally and self-custody specifically is the steep and unforgiving learning curve and the survivorship bias that means that people who screw up often don't share their stories of what went wrong. And one of the big challenges here is there are several sets of things you need to learn at the same time if you're new to the space or new to hardware wallets. You not only need to know the general principles of crypto and self-custody, but you also then need to have some understanding of how to select uh, the software you're going to use and get familiar with that software, as well as trying to get familiar with the hardware that you're learning to use as well. And any one of these things can completely trip you up. One of the biggest strengths of simply buying a hardware wallet, of following the documentation and sticking with the software that is bundled with it is that you can easily avoid a lot of the common mistakes from all of these different areas that you have to learn at the same time. You know, when you buy a hardware wallet, you aren't just paying for the hardware, but you're paying for up-to-date documentation and tutorials that are maintained by the vendor rather than things that go out of date after six months. You're paying for software that is easy to securely and safely download and install on your system, whatever system that happens to be. You're paying for the software and documentation tailored for your specific hardware that not only does things like check the genuineness of your device, but holds your hand through the entire setup process, often with pictures of what you will see on the screen along the way. You're paying for software that is designed to and enforces best practice, you know, even just basic things like forcing you to verify receive addresses on your hardware wallet, you know, best practices like that that are enforced or notifying you of firmware updates. When you buy a hardware wallet, you are paying for a company to have official support channels that you can ask for help on rather than just posting on Reddit or Telegram and then being bombarded with private messages from a whole bunch of scams and having to work out, you know, who is telling the truth and who is trying to scam you. You know, the security that simplicity provides by just sticking with the default, sticking with vendor supplied software and following the default process cannot be underestimated. And it is a really important part of helping people to successfully navigate the learning curve that comes with self-custody. That said, the simplicity also brings with it a number of trade-offs. And this is where I'm going to talk about some of the strengths of third-party software. The first and the big one that people will notice is availability and redundancy. If you've been around the space for any length of time, you'd be aware that it's almost a meme now that exchanges tend to go down whenever the market moves up or down in a big way really quickly. And you know, folk get upset that they can't deposit, withdraw, trade, or whatever it is they're trying to do. It's a really good illustration of, you know, not your keys, not your coins. The thing is, being unable to handle user demand is not just limited to exchanges, but that vendor supplied software wallets often struggle to keep up with demand when there are major market movements. This isn't theoretical, and this has happened with every major wallet vendor over the years, and it's a particular problem for wallets that lock you in to using their vendor supplied software. For example, during some of the major market movements last year, the Tandrum wallet app didn't work properly and there were no alternatives for users to use during this time to access their funds. And if you looked on their Reddit or their Telegram group, this led to all sorts of frustration, led to some people panicking because they thought that huge amounts of funds had not arrived, and it led to users doing really insecure things in their rush to be able to trade. 
you know, having the ability to simply use your hardware wallet with third party wallet software removes this issue entirely. You know, if you have a Trezor and all of Trezor's infrastructure goes down, you can simply load up your wallet in something like Sparrow for Bitcoin, MetaMask for Ethereum or whatever, and you can keep using your device accessing all of your funds as though nothing happened. You know, availability and redundancy is an important thing that third-party wallet software gives you. The other thing is ad functionality. You know, one of the other challenges with vendor-supplied software is that in order to keep things simple, they will generally only include the types of features that the vast majority of users will use. So for example, if you want to do something like cryptographically sign a message to prove that a message, you know, came from you or to prove that you control an address without having to make a transaction, you'll often need to use third-party software to do that this. Most vendor supply software does not include features like this. Likewise, if you're wanting to do complicated things like set up a multi-signature wallet, you'll often need to use third-party software. Most vendor supply software does not allow it. The other big advantage of third-party software is privacy. Depending on which brand of hardware wallet you have, even basic privacy tools like not reusing the same address over and over again for all of your transactions, being able to do things like coin control uh, and other just basic privacy features like this are often not supplied in vendor supplied wallet software. It's also important to say that while some vendor supplied wallet software like that from Ledger, Trezor, Bitbox and so on does allow you to run your own local node, you know, many don't. Uh, and using third party wallet software like Sparrow, Electrum or something else like that is another way that you can maximize your privacy and use your own local node rather than being dependent on and having to share aspects of your wallet information with the same company who sold you your hardware wallet. And all of this is before you consider the privacy implications of what kind of information a hardware wallet vendor can log when you're using their app, when you're buying services from them uh, and things like that. One of the other advantages of using third-party wallet software with your hardware wallet is the options it gives you during forks. You know, while there don't seem to be any major forks on the horizon for Bitcoin in the short term, there will certainly be some in the future. And forks, especially contentious ones, are a time when hardware vendors themselves have to decide which change they will support and which they will not. So having the ability to be able to use your hardware wallet with other third-party software can be an important way to continue accessing and using the chain that you want to use, whichever one that happens to be, rather than hoping that your vendor will support what you want. And the last one is a bit more paranoid than all of the others, but the last advantage of using third-party wallet software with your hardware wallet is decreasing the trust you place in the hardware to you know, not do the wrong things, especially with closed source hardware wallets. All of the drama around Ledger Recover a couple of years back highlighted some of the really valid concerns around whether a given hardware device may have, let's call them undocumented features, or what features could potentially be introduced through a malicious firmware update uh, in the case that a hardware vendor is hacked, uh, has staff who go rogue, or are compelled to sort of push some update to their users by uh, a third party. One of the major ways that these undocumented features could be used or malicious firmware could be delivered to your hardware device and exploited is through the software that comes from that same vendor. And simply avoiding running uh, software from the vendor on your computer is a good way to avoid that potential uh, way that these things could be delivered to your device or let's call it undocumented functionality could be activated and used. The question of which software you will use with your hardware wallet ultimately comes down to your level of experience, comes down to the types of features you want to use, and comes down to whether any of the sort of advantages or strengths that I've talked about in this video ultimately matter to you. There is no one-size-fits-all answer. For most people, you know, the vast majority of people, sticking with the standard setup, using the vendor-supplied software, and following the documentation to the letter will be the best solution. That said, this is not an either-or thing. One of the best ways to learn and get comfortable with open source options like Sparrow or Electrum is to start with your accounts in you know, a vendor supplied uh, software package that came with your hardware wallet and to work through the process of downloading, verifying and installing uh, an alternative 
third party wallet software and importing all of your existing accounts into that. So you can see your funds on both sets of software at the same time. And you'll actually notice this is what I do in most of my review videos. Even if you like vendor supplied wallet software, it is worth taking the time to learn how to use the alternatives. Because I would suggest that doing this can help you to better understand what is going on behind the scenes as well as giving you options to boost your privacy and your security. Most importantly, it decreases your dependence on your hardware wallet vendor. Because in all of this, the very worst time to have to learn how to use third-party wallet software is when you are in a panic, trying to make a transaction, trying to work out why your funds aren't appearing correctly due to a temporary outage uh, with your vendor supplied wallet software. And this is also an exercise that is worth doing because you might be someone who discovers that actually your hardware wallet doesn't have any other alternatives. And if you're someone who's looking to buy a hardware wallet, whether you're looking to buy one for the first time or replace an upgrade one that you have, I think that question of what vendor supplied software is available is something you should really make sure you understand. If you're someone who's never had a hardware wallet before and are looking to buy one, I think it is really worth getting one that comes with good vendor supplied software just to help you to get set up to avoid common mistakes and just really get a handle on how everything works. And uh, at the same time, I think it's also worth getting getting a hardware device that can be used with third party software, meaning that you are free to learn and grow and dabble uh, and try other software rather than being locked into or dependent on what the vendor has supplied. And you know, as a general rule, I think it is worth avoiding hardware wallets that lock you in to vendor supplied software. It is just not worth all of the extra issues that that can bring. At the same time, this is a big part of why I think that any hardware wallet that does not come with vendor supplied software is automatically only going to be suitable for advanced users. Because when you buy one of these hardware devices or if you build a DIY device that doesn't come uh, with something that you can just sort of follow and use, uh, it really can make it a challenge to be both learning a new hardware device, to be learning some new software and learning all of the general practices uh, and things that go along with that. Uh, there are plenty of folk who do work it, but there are plenty of folk who screw it up quite badly. So if you're an advanced user, these kinds of devices are fine, but for everyone else, I think your best bet is to start with something, get really familiar with how the vendor supplied software works, master that, and then expand out and grow from there. If you're someone who has had any experiences, good or bad, with vendor supplied wallet software and want to discuss that in the comments, that's a great place to do it. Likewise, if you have a particular hardware wallet and are curious about what third party software might work well with that, uh, definitely just leave a reply in the comments as well. I do my best to reply to all of them. Other than that, stay safe. Thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful. Hit like if you think that other people would find this video useful and hit subscribe if you'd like to be kept in the loop about future content I make that helps people stay safe in the crypto space and to recover if they get into trouble. If you have any questions about this video or a topic that you'd like me to cover, just leave a reply.